on. <laughs> okay, if people would take their seats, please. Welcome back, everyone. This is Miriam Nisbet. I appreciate everybody keeping to the time, time restraints, and uh, we're back and ready to go. I understand that our audio issue from uh, earlier has been resolved, so we are uh, we are back in we are back in business in terms of our live streaming, and we have audio now. So thank you for thank you for that work. Uh, getting us there. Um, we are going to now turn to the subcommittee on proactive disclosures. Our chairs for that are David Reed and Eric Gillespie, and uh, they have a report for us. <coughs> who's who's going to go first? Uh, I'm starting it. Thank uh, you, David. Thanks, Miriam. Uh, so Eric and I are going oh, to. Oh, David, work. excuse me one second. Let me just be sure that we've got Clay and Dave. Yep, President of the for Dave. Okay. Yep. Great, thank you. Sorry, David, for that no interruption. Problem. Thank you. Uh, Eric and I are going to lay out the preparatory work that we've uh, been doing, and uh, then we're going to be pitching for uh, uh, more help from other committee members. <coughs> uh, we're going to start with uh, some background that's familiar already to many of you. Uh, the Freedom of Information Act already requires two kinds of proactive disclosure. Uh, the first is regarding publication of the Federal Register. Uh, that's for some basic organizational information, which gets published as the U.S. government manual. Um, uh, the uh, requirements which the public to subject, uh, which is through publication of uh, rules and forms. Um, and uh, these uh, requirements in Section A1 of the Act uh, are not met through publication all at one time in one place for an agency so it comes out as particular items are issued. Uh, the second kind of proactive disclosure that's already required uh, is what used to be referred to as the reading room requirements, now often called the electronic reading room requirements, uh, the requirements that certain information must be placed where the public can read and copy it, now that's typically a website, um, or the agency is also allowed to publish and sell the information, that's an alternative. Um, and this applies uh, to opinions and orders to adjudicate cases, statements of policy that are not published in the Federal Register, uh, staff manuals instructions to the public, and uh, of particular interest here, records already released under FOIA, which are likely to be subject to subsequent requests. Um, and that's often referred to as a rule of three, because an agency says, if we've had a FOIA for it before, and we get a second, and we anticipate that it's a third, then that's all generally interpreted as meeting the test of uh, uh, likely to be sub subsequent requests. Um, and then the requirement is also for the um, play, uh, an index to all of the above to be made available in the reading room, now often a website. Uh, there's been guidance, non-binding guidance, uh, during the current administration that encourages further proactive disclosure. Uh, so, for example, the President's Memorandum of 2009, agencies should take affirmative steps to make information public, should not wait for specific requests. <clears throat> that was followed by the Attorney General's Memorandum. Agencies should readily and systematically post information online in advance of public requests. Uh, legislation that uh, just recently passed, <clears throat> and the implementing regulations are still being developed, uh, the Data Act, which is separate from FOIA, but certainly is relevant uh, when you look at uh, proactive disclosure issues. Uh, so the, the Data Act builds on top of the existing USAspending.gov uh, disclosures about grants, contracts, uh, loans. Uh, what the Data Act adds to what's already been disclosed uh, is data about agency budgets, uh, commitments and expenditures, which are different stages in the federal spending process. An agency commits, uh, 
then obligates, then expends, and so under data act, you see all those steps separately. Um, reprogramming, that is uh, moving funds, usually requiring permission of Congress from one, uh, from one uh, purpose-related account to another. Uh, and the fund balances, the money that's available uh, in a particular account. Um, also relevant to the issue of corrective disclosure is how the Data Act requires this information to be made available to the public. One is <coughs> that the information must be available as a bulk download and machine readable. Um, we've probably all had the uh, situation of trying to get information from a website where the website does allow us to search for a particular record, but if we wanted to see the whole context of a mass of records, we would have to go through that search thousands of times. Um, the data act requires uh, the, the ability to just download the records in bulk so people can analyze the information uh, in context. Um, another requirement, development and use of common terms, formats, and definitions uh, for some key financial data elements. Um, this is actually shows, I think, the difference between a data uh, provision approach and a record uh, provision approach uh, in that when we, develop, when we disclose records under FOIA, uh, we're showing them in the context that the government is holding them. Uh, whereas when you have a, a data disclosure, such as under the Data Act, then the agency is designing the format in which the information is going to be presented and the context, and therefore you have to have standards uh, for, for that. Um, uh, finally, the data act requires that the information posted is subject to audit by GAO and by agency inspectors general. Um, and, and again, that's uh, different when you're looking at is the agency disclosing the data in an accurate way versus the FOIA, when we hand over a record, it's kind of as it is, the, the agency has not had a chance to put a spin on it. Um, Eric, could you talk through sure. the uh, benefits? <laughs> so we, we, at our June meeting, uh, talked at length about the benefits of transparency, open data, and open government, and what the attributes of good governance uh, related to that are. In addition to that, today there are many great business cases that we can point to in the private sector where companies are using this as raw material that have uh, a good economic impact uh, and create jobs. And, and we also think there's a lift that can be achieved by providing some of this data in machine readable formats to the private sector. And if we're successful with routinizing much of the standard scenarios, agencies can then begin to focus their very expensive and, and valuable resources on the things that have a greater positive impact in terms of disclosure. If you go to the next slide, please. We put forward on the subcommittee uh, this thesis. There were two primary tacks that we thought we could take um, that, that we'd like to talk about today. First, we thought we could cluster the types of records, which will vary by agency, into a common taxonomy in order to begin to look at the trends and the patterns across a wide swath of FOIA records. And second, if we could identify the personas of the requesters, um, which are probably more macro across agencies, uh, we can begin to see where the critical needs are that, that emerge and analyze those, those needs to establish baselines for systematizing the requests and uh, beginning to look at the backlog of requests and, and how people go about requesting and what those needs are. And with those two tacks, identifying the, the primary types of records that are there within agencies and the types of requesters, the personas of the requesters, um, and the intersection of those two things, we think it provides a lot of value to informing a proactive disclosure policy. 
the next slide um, is a excerpt from the Center for Effective Government report from March of 2014. This is just 15, of, uh, 15 agencies representing 590,000 FOIA requests in fiscal 12 and a staff of 3,200 people that are dedicated to serving up these requests across the 15 agencies. And again, it, the, the standard deviation across the caseload is pretty wide. The average is about 220 per, per FTE. Um, but it also demonstrates that the clustering that we talked about is agency specific. So you're going to see a wide variance in the types of clusters of requests within agencies. Uh, and it, again, it serves to highlight the variance across agencies. Um, it also, I think, demonstrates the net positive impact that's possible if the needs of the requesters and the primary clusters are, are identified and our approach to proactive disclosure is, is met across those two vectors. We have run into some significant challenges. The mechanics of this are not, not trivial, as I think everyone on the committee knows. Uh, we began pulling FOIA logs and looking for trend lines. Um, we couldn't find enough to be statistically significant, um, and we need, desperately need help with this. Um, even trying things like using basic word clouds to see some trends and, and uh, patterns proved to be very difficult, and um, we're struggling with this. So um, we have some, some challenges and questions here. We would love to find a couple of pilot agencies around this table to help us with this, and uh, um, that will be one of our requests from the subcommittee is to help us create a corpus um, and a pilot Within a, within a couple of agencies to prove out this theory? Um, <clears throat> we have found an example of the kind of analysis that Eric was just talking about, uh, not with regard to a federal agency, um, but uh, with regard to a New York State agency, uh, which operates under a, a state-level law that's similar to FOIA. Um, and this was a non-government organization that was able to analyze the uh, FOIA logs, or in their case, FOIA logs, from the New York State Agency. Um, and they found the kind of results that Eric was talking about in terms of clusters of records requested and uh, personas, or types of, of parties that are requesting. Uh, so they found that 55% of the requests uh, were for just a few types of uh, records. Uh, that are listed here, uh, reports about specific addresses, uh, inspection of landfill, air quality, whatnot. Uh, over half of the FOIA requests were for these. Um, also, the uh, researchers uh, looked at who had filed these requests. Uh, they saw that there were a fairly small number of um, uh, firms in the real estate industry that made up a large share of the requests. Um, they interviewed two of the largest requesters, uh, and those requesters said that they'd be very happy to get that data uh, from a website rather than having to go through the process of, um, of requesting it by FOIA. Uh, so this is an example of the kind of findings uh, that we're hoping will show potential in the federal government uh, for finding, um, as Eric said, uh, types of records, uh, which, if they were proactively disclosed, uh, could just be looked up by the interested parties as opposed to having the parties and the government undertake the burden of processing a FOIA for them. Um, one other example of the kind of opportunity we're looking for uh, is what's already happening under the Single Audit Act. Uh, this is a federal law which requires uh, that it, an entity that receives at least a half million dollars in federal grants. That threshold is about to be increased right now. It's half million. Um, the entity must uh, send financial statement, management discussion, auditor's opinion, and details of the grant. Um, these are all sent to the department, uh, to, uh, to the Bureau of the Census, which acts as a central collection point, although the census then farms them out 
to the specific cognizant agencies for each, um, for each entity's grants. Um, as Eric said, you know, one of the reasons we want to get the information out there uh, is so that it can be productive economic use of it. In the case of the Single Audit Act reports, uh, there's at least one company uh, that wants to use uh, these disclosures, this data, uh, in order to do ratings of municipal bonds, um, which are right now apparently done on a fairly subjective basis. This company is trying to develop um, a more data-based approach, and they want this data to do it. Uh, clearly, you know, if, uh, if companies are able to produce more accurate uh, ratings of bonds, and that improves the efficiency of the capital markets. So there's a public benefit. Um, the company actually ran a test to see whether these, uh, these reports would be available through FOIA. So they FOIA'd four uh, reports, uh, all of which were released unredacted, indicating that the information you know, is suitable to be released to the public. Uh, however, you know, the FOIA took multiple follow-ups. It took two and a half months, um, which is not surprising. Uh, because many of you are familiar with the situation. Um, uh, census got the FOIA requests. Census said, well, the custodian of records is the agency we sent the report to, so they have to send it to the custodian of records. They have to say, well, this information was submitted by another party, the grantee, so we have to check with them. Um, and before you know it, you know, two and a half months seems quick. Um, now, the OMB has issued rules which uh, will affect the reports filed after this year, which change the system to proactive disclosure. And what these new OMB rules say is that when the single Audit Act reports come in, they all have to get posted to a single website where they're available to the public. And of course, they run into issues that we're going to run into whenever we look at proactive disclosure. For example, is the information releasable? In the case of, uh, of this, uh, OMB has addressed the issue of personal identifiable information, PII. They've addressed it by putting into the new OMB regulations that the submitters, the, uh, the grantees, are responsible for not putting PII into their reports. Um, and therefore, putting the responsibility on that stage to avoid the necessity of the agency reviewing everything before it gets posted for PII. Um, also of interest to us is because this disclosure is being done under separate legislative authority than the FOIA Act, um, the FOIA restrictions are not explicitly applicable. Uh, in fact, the only uh, restriction that is in the OMB regulations explicitly uh, is an exemption for information that's restricted by federal statute or regulation, uh, which is one of our FOIA exemptions, but certainly not the whole panoply of it. Uh, so I think it highlights an issue that comes up whenever we're going to look at other options for practical disclosure, which is, you know, what is going to be non-releasable and how do we build into the process uh, preventing things that are properly non-releasable. Uh, can you... Sure. Talk, so talk my forward. As we look at the options for proactive disclosure and moving this upstream in the process, um, there are three things that we're asking the members of the committee to consider. One, we would love to hear, even anecdotally, uh, what you are doing within your agency or what you'd like to do that you can't do today that this might help with. Um, two, we desperately need a data set and a corpus of data that we can begin to work with to prove out this theory, uh, that we can, we can begin to point machines at and, and grind through some of this data to see what patterns and trends emerge. And three, we need help just in terms of the cluster analysis and identifying the types of records that emerge once we do point machines at it and the types of requesters that we see emerge uh, in terms of the personas that we identify. Uh, that's pretty much it. I, I, I actually like to thank um, uh, Lee, who uh, joined our subcommittee and then had to take a break from the committee and is back with us. Um, 
And uh, also like to thank Melanie who gave us a great pointer to a search for agency FOIA logs, uh, which has been a very useful data source. Guess we're ready for discussion. That's what we have. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think um, we probably have a lot of comments and questions. Um, Krista, I wonder if you could go back to slide. Uh, oh. I can't wait. Oh. Oh. Is David doing? Go back to slide nine. I'm sorry. Thank you. There you go. Because I, I think that has the, mm -hmm. the, the places where you're asking for, for input. Um, so one thing um, maybe, because just a reminder for everyone, the materials, this presentation and the reports of the other two subcommittees are posted on the advisory committee website. We are, we're really, um, thanks to Krista's efforts, we're getting everything posted as quickly as we can as we have them so that everybody has them available. Um, one question I would have is on point number two with regard to the FOIA logs, it'd be great to, if you all would share the information you got or the source you got from Melanie because I think I've heard a lot of people say that's a very difficult thing to do is to find, find the four logs. Yes, I'll, I'll send it around and it, it, I was surprised, but it's, they're a lot more accessible than you would think. Good, that's good news. <laughs> that's great, really good to hear. Um, so could, could one of you or both of you talk a little bit more about what you're looking for in the way of cooperation to obtain data. I'll start. Um, we would love to find a, a, just a data set. Um, I'm not sure how far back the data goes in your respective agencies, but uh, it could be uh, you could provide it on a DVD, you could provide it uh, in a searchable database format in some sort of XML format. We can figure out variety of different ways to ingest the data into some sort of common format. But we are having a very difficult time finding a source for the data uh, and need to identify that source. Would it be a, uh, this is Melanie, would it be a, um, a data set that is not already public by yeah. the agency? That, that just, yeah. yeah, okay, so. Well, it, it's possible, this is David uh, Reed, it's possible that the data has been made public and we're just not aware of it, or it's possible that it's not, not yet been released. It's not accessible, uh, perhaps. Yeah. What, what we have found, for example, a lot of the uh, agency FOIA logs, um, they vary in the description that they give of the records requested. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when we started looking at some of them, we thought, well, we could not use this as a basis to figure out which type of record is requested for each request, uh, or, nor in some cases what the requester is. Um, and so we are looking for something beyond the, the publicly available logs we have been able to go through so far. Perhaps the information has already been publicly released and we just haven't been able to find it, I don't know. Anne. Hi, uh, this is Ann Wasman. I wanted to make you aware of a document that was put together a number of years ago with input from a fair number of organizations within the so-called openness community, which was a, a list of data sets that we were recommending be sort of first up for proactive disclosure. They're data sets that are common across all agencies within the government. And we did present it to the administration. It has never been acted on. It's been refined over the years. But as I said, it represents the work of a reasonable number of groups and might be interesting to look at. I mean, it's things from 
contract information to inspector general reports, you know, but again, the goal was to identify subsets that, at least from our community's perspective, were, uh, we, we wished, we, we wanted to be more easily accessible and that we thought are created across the agency lines. Oh, well, that's great. If you could email me a link, I'll post it with the, yes, uh, the rest I will. of the subcommittee documents. And, and, uh, uh, Larry, but let me just ask a follow-up question of Ann. Um, have you all identified any agency that seems to be coming close to fulfilling um, that, that wish? We, I don't, when we last took at, looked at it, we had not. We certainly were aware that some of these data sets were being made publicly available on a routine basis, at least by some agencies. Yeah. But, you know, what we were pushing for is kind of uniform, yes. you know, buy-in from all agencies. So we didn't really look, I haven't, I don't think we've looked at that issue. Uh, Larry and then Andrew. Uh, just as, I mean, EPA a couple years ago started posting all its FOIA requests and responsive records online. So you have full access. You can't download the whole data set, but you can clearly run reports for anything you want. And that's available through FOIA online for EPA. We rarely withhold <coughs> what a requester is asking for, except if it's personnel, you know, there's some very sensitive issues which we don't release, but most, probably 99% of our requests we do make it available to the public, so it may be a good that's, that's place great. for you to go. For, for the stuff that you have, that you are able to release, would it be possible to get it by bulk download? It's available on the website. You would, could go on and case by case or do a search on it. It's a full text retrievable, so you can search on any keyword. Thank you. Andrew. Hi, Andrew Becker from the Center for Investigative Reporting. Um, I know Dolores isn't here, but I imagine she wouldn't mind if I volunteer some information from the Department of Homeland Security, which um, out of your list was, had far and away the, the most requests. I think the number two agency that gets um, um, the second most amount of requests at Homeland Security is Customs and Border Protection. And I think there probably is an interesting data set to break down in terms of individuals, um, journalists looking for data sets for trade. Um, and so there's some business element to it. And I actually believe, to my understanding, that they have done some um, some quantitative analysis. I know, I think journalists like make up 5% of requesters. So I think they do have some sense of the type of requester. So that might be a robust data set if you can get them to cooperate. That might be a, a good place to start as well. Thank you. So we'll make sure that Dolores knows that uh, her yeah. department has been volunteering. And she can thank me for volunteering her. <laughs> well, knowing Dolores, she will be the first one to step right up. Yeah. So. Um, we have just a, a few minutes, so um, I do want to get any other comments. Plus, I want to ask the chairs just to quickly tell us sort of what the next steps forward are so that we know what to expect um, in January. Nay. Um, first off, I, I want to say uh, the prospect for deep in the weeds analysis of this data is really exciting. Um, so I look forward to that. Uh, but I also want to, two quick suggestions. And, almost more um, bang for the buck suggestions. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, that the current rule is that if a request is requested three times, that in my experience no one's really tracking, they put it online. Um, and to me that seems like a ripe target for modernization. I know EPA posts all the requests online, or all their re responses online. I know the Department of State does a great job posting millions, I think all of them online quarterly. Um, ice cap, other countries do it. So I think something, another avenue of proactive posting we may want to work on is finding a way to change the three-time request to ideally um, most of the universe of released documents. I know uh, the documents are already digital at agencies through FOIA online. Um, so I think a bang for the buck might be getting someone to change the wording from three times to if at all possible and follow the lead of our other star agencies throughout the government. Um, and then at least in my second point that when I bring this up to people, the biggest hurdle I always hear to proactive posting is 508 compliance. Um, and I think at our last meeting, someone from the audience wisely said, if we don't do anything other than fix 508, this will be a success. Um, so, so I'd like to, and I'll volunteer to work with the, the subcommittee, um, to examine those two really important issues um, to maybe 
I don't know so much about, I don't know anything about the computer analysis, but if we can um, fix 508 and <coughs> nudge agencies to post the releases that they've already spent hours working on to spend, in my opinion, a few more minutes and put them online for everyone to see, not one person to put in a desk drawer, it would be great progress. Thank you. This is Clay Johnson, and I, that was me who said that, and uh, I'm willing to help in whatever way I can with you. I just wanted to mention that since I can't raise my hand. <laughs> could, could you just say that again? We had a hard time hearing you in the beginning. <laughs> sure, this is Clay Johnson, and I, that was me who mentioned the 508 compliance at the last meeting, and I'm willing to help in any way I can, so just please uh, reach out to me and, and let me help. Thank you. Um, I'm hurt. I heard I'm willing to help, so who is that? Clay Johnson. Clay. And um, I think everybody agreed at our last meeting that that absolutely has to be a priority. We all want to We all want to reach that goal. This is Ginger. I, I do have one comment in relation to that. Clay. As someone who works a lot with reporters, I do think that there's some value in not necessarily posting the documents up immediately, building some delay into it. Uh, if a reporter or a requester puts so much work into making a request, following it through either the administrative system or litigation, I do think that it's fair to give them two or three or four days to review those documents and have some sort of exclusive on it. Um, I know that I have a much harder time ta taking documents out and getting reporters to cover them and getting widespread coverage if it's not an exclusive. And I think that it would actually chill the incentives on the, especially a reporter side, um, if there wasn't some at least you know three day delay there to give them exclusive access to the documents it's just something to consider no, it's like but i definitely think that having everything up online is is a laudable goal but i think that we need to consider that interest this is larry this, Osmond. Just, this I, mean, is Dave I think we need to treat everybody alike though so reporters need to get treated like everybody else does so if you if you're going to do it for reporters you need to do it for everybody I think that there's some interest on commercial requesters' side, too. If they're paying for the documents, they might want a few days of exclusive access to those documents. I mean, c the commercial requesters do pay for access to these documents. There is some interest in that. I, and I don't think that it undercuts the public's access to the documents to build in three days of delay. I think that it's a reasonable balance. Could I suggest that this issue, which is I'm, I'm seeing a lot of interest in, and it's certainly an issue that's been around for a long time, that that be folded into those of you who have a, an opinion and an interest in it, please make this part of the proactive disclosure work. Yeah, I'd be happy to keep please, talking with Please you do. Um, it's our, I just, I'd like to comment um, regarding the repeated request issue. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I think that there's a, there's a subset of not request for the same document, but re repeated requests for the same type of information that I, I see with, coming up with my clients, particularly with federal agencies that do work out in the world, field agencies and, and collect field data and that sort of thing in a predictable way. And a lot of my clients have difficulty accessing the information in a timely manner year after year after year particularly if they're being called upon to comment or participate in the agency planning process. And it, you know, I have one client that always seeks information for field work that's done in the summertime in the Pacific Northwest so they can comment on management decisions that happen in the wintertime and the agency very predictably slow walks its response so that the client doesn't have access to the information until after the planning process is closed. And so that falls through the cracks because they're not asking for the same document, they're asking for the same, same. type of information. So I would suggest that that also be a consideration as we talk about proactive disclosures. So that, that's specifically what Eric. the cluster analysis should Eric. be able to address. This is Eric Gillespie. Um, one thing that we hadn't considered, which we will based on that comment, is looking at a time dimension to see if there's any seasonality or cyclicality to the types of requests on a, on a time horizon, uh, which there may be, which could be interesting. So um, Dave, thank you. Thank you for that comment. And it sounded like you were volunteering to be part of this committee, <laughs> the subcommittee. Yes? Yes. Okay. Yes, I will. All right. 
Uh, Andrew, this is the last comment because we do need to move to the third. Sure, and, and this kind of overlaps a little bit with, with oversight as well, and that is with with the repeated requests, but it also has to deal with um, if you appeal a decision, uh, a, a response. And on appeal, you're actually able to get those record, the, res the records released. And how there sometimes is a disconnect then back to the original FOIA process or the FOIA office. So you have to go back and just request this, the records if you're looking for updates. Mm -hmm. So they're just, if there's some sort of, it goes to maybe internal policing as well. If there's some sort of precedent that's been set at the agency in releasing the records, that that should be communicated and, and, and documented, so. Good point. Thank you. So um, we do new, need to move to the next subcommittee, but um, thank you so much for that report and thank provocative uh, uh, points. Um, we will, um, I think you have a lot of people to work with you. Yeah, thank you for everybody who worked to help. Thank you. So we're gonna move to uh, the subcommittee on FOIA fees. And we have Jim Hogan and Ginger McCall, who are the co-chairs and um, We'd like to hear from you now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Miriam, um, on behalf of the Department of Defense, we'd like to thank you for your service, uh, chairing this committee in the five years at OGIS, getting it standing up. You know it hasn't been easy uh, in many times, and it's difficult to work with um, agencies and other entities. Uh, we do appreciate what you've done. We think you have done much to facilitate communication between us and requesters and interagency. We do appreciate that very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, we met uh, a week ago at our first meeting, and I'd like to thank my co-chair, uh, Ginger McCall, for hosting us at Epic Headquarters in Washington, D.C. Uh, we started the meeting, and, and I have four items of agenda. Uh, let me just go over those uh, briefly, and we'll talk about how we, how we approached each one. First would be, um, we want to explore, are there really, potent what are the f potential fee issues, uh, and how are they being perceived? Remember the uh, brainstorming we had in, in June? Um, a lot of it, you know, was based on perception. Even the word uh, animosity was brought up. And uh, is there an animosity existing? Um, another one would say, if we if go from there to the next point, where would what are avenues, potential avenues to gather any kind of relevant uh, data uh, to further define the issues? And thirdly, um, we thought maybe it'd be relevant to look at how other countries handle their fee issues and their open access laws. And then we want to discuss what are we going to do at the end? What's our end product here for our subcommittee? Uh, after a lot of discussion, there was a consensus that there is, there is um, some animosity between FOIA requesters, FOIA entities and organizations, and uh, the federal government, uh, officials, uh, FOIA officers who are working FOIA requests. Uh, concerning fees, um, it seems like, uh, I'm basically talking consensus here of the committee, like a lot of time is spent by government officials dealing with fee issues. Uh, I think the perception from FOIA officers is that this is a difficult issue to really deal with sometimes. Um, there's maybe a lack of understanding of fee-related requirements by FOIA officers including that lack of understanding what the act requires and what the relevant case law says. Uh, there may be confusion among FOIA officers about the definitions and standards, for example, fee category. I know some members of this committee have been put into three or four fee categories. Probably everyone probably made some up too. And they, <laughs> so that, that's, that's, that's been an issue. We recognize that. Uh, there is a lack of consistency, perceived lack of consistency on, on you know, some entities would say, well, I got a fee waiver here. I didn't get one there. Maybe exact same request. And also, uh, it, there is, seems to be a perception of a uh, greater amount of voluminous requests and vague requests, people asking for anything and everything. Uh, how is that related to fee issues we explored? And maybe um, another related issue started coming in here, and not sure whether we want to, at the time, approach it by the subcommittee, but maybe something to do with is resource issues. You know, are some of these requests becoming a, a burden on agencies? Um, and some of us have been around for a couple of decades, you know, may, may be able to, to address that better. Um, we talked about the importance of gaining uh, some kind of empirical evidence. Uh, statistics may be difficult because even statistics based, you know, where we're having annual reports don't really address the issues per se. Uh, and a lot of you know, we talked about complex, simple requests, but that's even a subjective call from agency to agency. There's no standardization there. 
Uh, so we're wondering maybe um, more anecdotal evidence, uh, gathering data, talking to uh, FOIA requesters, talking to other agencies, maybe even talking to our counterparts in other countries, and that gets back to the, the data collection. And uh, Krista was at our meeting, and, and you know she's going, uh, she's looking into it, and we've discussed before. And I didn't mention foreign government, so that's another issue. You know whether you know how much. I mean, guys, uh, Maggie's on the phone. She goes, "Well, I can talk to my counterparts." And we said, "Well, we're not, we're not sure right now." So understand the clearly the rules of, you know, data collection or just talking interviews. I think we can within our own agencies, uh, but um, we want to see exactly what the issues are out there and how we can further define what the issues are. Uh, we looked at briefly uh, the go open government laws of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK, and we also discussed Mexico and. Uh, the, the, how they might be related uh, to what we have, recognizing they have, especially the parliamentary governments are very different than our government. Uh, and some of these laws are very, you know, the, the uh, UK has only had um, their freedom of information law for 10 years now. Uh, but I, I think there's, we can get some good uh, ideas from them. FOIA requesters are FOIA requesters, the same from one country to another. So uh, I think there's some commonality there. Uh, we looked at a couple potential end products uh, the first would be some kind of may maybe guidance. There's a lot of guidance out there already, but maybe something that defines specifically f FOIA terms, specifically from, again, this is just brainstorming here, um, common terms that are seen to be misunderstood. We can understand what is being misunderstood out there. Uh, you know, the, the hard concrete terms that are in, in, in the act itself and maybe related uh, case law. And the second potentially could be a legislative proposal. Uh, through AGIS. If we see, you know, that the act itself causes maybe some confusion, interpretation, you know, we may get different courts interpreting it different ways, maybe a legislative proposal uh, uh, would, would be in the making. Uh, I think pretty much our consensus was keep it the same for commercial requesters. Uh, the only thing there's an issue there seems to be with other, you know, public interest groups. Um, other things here, and then we'll also explore some of the uh, uh, congressional record uh, that when discussions were made, uh, and a lot of that is already publicly available. And uh, we have a next meeting also in December, and we haven't uh, have the date yet, but I'll work with Marty and others so we don't conflict with our with our subcommittee meetings here. Uh, but we want, we're, the, some of the members are, the things they're looking at right now, it would be exploring some case law agency regulations which we would hope there'd be some kind of consistency there in how they relate uh, fee issues, and other uh, sources for current definitions of various categories and other fee-related issues. We may see uh, some misunderstanding out there in written regulations. We don't think, because the regulations go, as some of us know here, a very, very thorough, comprehensive review. And, but we might see something out there. Other members are going to do research on what other countries are doing also. Um, and then once we uh, have, have good understanding what kind of information we can collect from the public, et cetera, we will go out there and uh, start gathering um, uh, some, uh, some information. Uh, and what we wanted, we recognize, uh, I, I like the term Mark used, jump into litigation. We recognize sometimes the fee issues do cause jump into litigation. Um, and that's one of our things is try to avoid that. And sometimes the solution is just better communications between a FOIA requester and the government. Sometimes it isn't. It, it, it depends. It really uh, changed. But I, I, I'm just wondering, and maybe this will be discussion here, how much do resource issues in federal agencies, how much does that play into, into um, why, why there's some of this animosity um, to that extent? And Ginger, do you have anything to add? I did actually want to thank uh, the students from our Georgetown Law of Open Government course for their work on some of the research here. We're looking pretty intensely into the case law around the definitions of news media, non-scientific, uh, or non-commercial scientific organizations and educational institutions, so. Good. Wow, thank you. All right. Questions, comments, Mark. Mark Zaid. This is sort of an overlap between mm -hmm. our 
our two subcommittees, although it's a little bit outside of, I think, both when I think of fees, so I'm thinking of attorney's fees. And, and one of the things that I think would be very interesting, and Jim, you talked about the resources, you know, as I'm sure pretty much everybody here knows, there was an amendment to the language a few years ago that took attorney's fees from, instead of being paid from the general operating treasury fund, whatever we call it in the United States, regular mm -hmm. U.S. Treasury, what's it called? Judgment, Judgment, Judgment Fund. Mm -hmm. It comes out of the agency's budgets, and which, frankly, I didn't think, I understood the notion of it, but I didn't think it was a very smart thing to do because you could, some of the litigation that we handle goes on for so many years, we can wipe out an agency's budget very easily with the amount of attorney's fees, especially at some of our hourly rates. And I have no idea if there has been any analysis of attorney's fees since that amendment came forward and the impact it has had on agencies' FOIA budgets and resources, uh, positive or negative. I'm not sure what the positive could be. I could only imagine really a negative. Uh, and as to whether that needs to be changed back, perhaps. Frankly, I don't care where I get paid as long as I get paid. It doesn't matter where, and I certainly don't want to hurt an agency's budget along the way to make it more difficult for other FOIA requesters to come after. Uh, that may be something we can jointly look into uh, with the two subcommittees. I think that's a really good idea. Other, other comments on that? Um, Nate? This, this is on something different. Okay, hold, hold it one second. Um, I, I, I will tell you that um, this is Miriam. In con in connection with the study that Mark Mark Grunewald did of litigation, one of the issues that um, I, I'm aware that he was looking at was trying to get a handle on the issue of um, attorneys' fees. And I know that it's it's very difficult to, to pin it down, mm -hmm. uh, particularly because those are just not necessarily reported, and right. particularly if they're as a result of a settlement agreement. They're not they're just not necessarily going to be, Correct. you know, out there obvious and uh, available for uh, analysis. Um, I mean, we do. Uh, this is Melanie. We do as part of the DOJ litigation and compliance report. We include a listing every year of all the FOIA litigation cases, and then we also include it's required that we include whether or not there was an award of attorney's fees in the amount. Mm -hmm. So that's available on our website. Uh, this is Ginger. I'm sorry. I actually took a look at that lately and realized that there were some flaws and inaccuracies in it. I don't know. It's something we can chat about more outside of the meeting, but we have had a hard time. I think that what Mark Grunewald used was actually track, maybe, or, or scraping the pacer he docket. Had several, he had several sources. Right. But it's hard. It's very difficult to track down the actual amount of litigation fees. But it is something that potentially we could look into. Yeah, I just added in. Also, I mean, there's litigation cases that are settled in which fees are paid, so that wouldn't be included in the in the statistics gathered. Yeah, I think that was the inaccuracies that we saw related to our own lawsuits were usually cases that were settled, and it might so, also be a, a, an issue of this. There was a case and it was settled like in the, a later year, um, so the, that could cause problems. The 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 issue of attorneys' fees is just this is Melanie again. I just want to make sure we realize it's completely different than assessing fees in response to FOIA mm -hmm. requests. Yes. So we've now just sort of like blended the two things, but it's really it's a whole different topic. It's obviously controlled by uh, the fees are awarded by a court. So you know it's a very under under standards that are set out in the statute. It's really a very different animal than I think what you guys were talking about with your committee. What I think we had to, was our, the agreement of what it would be looking at, which is ways to see whether the assessment of fees to FOIA requesters could be improved, if that process could be improved. It, it, you're, you're right, but I thought that Mark was tying in the issue of FOIA litigation over fees. It, yeah, I, and especially just listening to what Jim was talking about and realizing that subcommittee's talking more about the sort of the front end of fee assessments, right. fee waivers, right. but in thinking about fees, it's still, and it ties into us. I mean, for example, with our number four litigation prong, one of the concerns we had when this change was made was, is this going to be an incentive for the federal government to litigate the case longer 
in the hope that maybe instead of settling it early because there would be fees, it might be not necessarily the Justice Department lawyers, the agency itself didn't want to, might, I'm speculating, might not want to settle because it's going to come out of their budget. And if they litigate it longer, there's obviously a risk of incurring greater fees, but you might even be able to secure a, a victory so that there wouldn't be any fees. So that, that's not a positive uh, outcome of, of what this uh, provision was. I, I don't know, I don't even know if there's any way to measure that other than talking to U.S. Attorney's offices and federal programs branch to get a sense, did that ever anecdotally ever come up or an agency? Uh, but certainly if, since we're talking about fees and the impact that fees have, as you said, on the efficiency of the office, the resources of the office, then that directly ties into attorney's fees since it's coming from the agency's budget. Right, and it was that tie-in that I think, I think you were just suggesting this subcommittee be aware of. Yes. Uh, Nate. Sure. Um, another uh, issue that I think the subcommittee, I, I think would be a good idea if they tackle to decrease um, fee animosity, might be this issue of um, when an agency can charge fees and what fees they can charge if they go over the deadline. Um, it feels, uh, I know that there's discrepancy, but the law was, to my understanding, the law was amending in 2007 to say that if an agency goes over this 20 or 30 day deadline, um, they can't, they can only charge for non-commercial requesters, they can only charge reproduction fees. And many agencies do that. Um, but some agencies now say, through what in my opinion is a strange loophole, say that um, the request is unusual so we don't have to follow what Congress wrote. So if we can get rid of that case, that could cause a lot of the animosity to go away. Or maybe I'm wrong, and maybe this FOIA subcommittee needs that, to come yeah, in. That was something, yeah, I, this I, is Ginger. That's something that we actually right. did discuss in our subcommittee meeting. I mean, you know this is something very dear to my heart. Um, I hope and you tackle it. It's certainly something that we that we plan on tackling, at least I, I hope that we will. Well, and I, 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 I think uh, it, when you say loophole, it is in the law. Uh, that the actual unusual language, the language, language of the law statute that. says, unless unusual circumstances Well, exist. I think the, the definition of unusual is Maybe further, being stretched. It's, defined no. in another, it's actually defined in another part of the law. In the other and part of the law, though, it yeah. only gives you an extra right. 10 days to respond, not a blank right. check. Right. No, but it defines, yeah. just, I mean, just so you guys know, I mean, I just this is Melanie again to, to, to support what Jim is saying. I mean, the law actually says, unless unusual or exceptional circumstances, as they're defined in the FOIA apply. So that's, it's coming straight from. Right, language. but unusual so, is all. 10 days, not infinity. Um, yeah, this is Anne, if I could just, I think this discussion illustrates exactly <laughs> what we're talking about that goes on. I mean, I could make just as rational and passionate an argument of what I think the statute means. I don't think the point is you're right, I'm wrong, or I'm right, you're wrong, but it is exactly this kind of conflict that gets played out again and again and again mm -hmm. on the issue of fees. And that's why I think it's so critical that your committee tackle this issue. Mm -hmm. I think misunderstand is the, is the word that, that Jim uh, used, and I think that's just exactly identifying those areas that are so often and repeatedly misunderstood would be very valuable. Yeah, that's a large part, this is Ginger, um, a large part of what we're hoping to do here is to create some kind of uniform guidance, because um, a lot of the, the fee acrimony comes from well, another agency said that I'm a news media requester. Why are you telling me that I'm an ordinary requester? Uh, well, I'm a blogger. I have a blog. Why are you telling me that I'm not a news media requester? Or these sorts of, uh, of fee and delay issues. I mean, if there was something uniform that requesters could count on, I think it would go a long way toward cutting down on the acrimony. And this is Karen Finnegan. I think that all of us agree that simplifying the process is really the, the goal the underlying goal and how we get there, we're not sure yet. But um, Jim and I, you know, we're very clear that there is too much time spent in agencies on fee issues to no good result. It just delays the entire process. It expends resources, and I think, at least from my perspective, simplifying whatever process that we arrive at, I think, is. Um, the best we can do to help agencies and requesters. 
This is Dave Barr, and I'd like to speak to the, the question of uh, assessment of fees when deadlines are missed. Um, I, it would be, as far as the guidance that we provide, I think it's important that the best practices uh, contemplate an agency addressing the deadline issue and whether fees can be assessed. I, it's been many years since the 2007 amendments went in place, and I have yet to see an agency affirmatively state, oh, we missed our deadline, therefore we're not charging you these fees. And time after time after time, it's incumbent upon my clients to affirmatively step forward and say, you can't charge me these fees because you missed your deadline. Sometimes the agency will say, okay, you're right, you got us. Often they'll contest it. But uh, as far as I understand the statute and the recent decision in crew, um, there is nothing that requires an agency to affirmatively state or to affirmatively address the fee assessment slash deadline compliance issue in its response in its final decision. And I think that that would be a very useful thing to, to enhance the process and reduce animosity so that the requesters are fully apprised of their rights. Because most people don't know that. Most people are not aware that an agency can't assess fees. I mean, people that are in this room, the professional FOIA people know that, but people I deal with on a daily basis uh, don't know that. And fees are commonly assessed even after agencies egregiously blow their deadlines. And so that's a major, major issue that Congress, congressional intent, I think, is being undermined in this regard. This is Ginger, so if I understand, I think what you're suggesting is that perhaps we include some sort of recommendation on public education on fee issues? Yes, I think okay. that the best practice is that the guidance issued from DOJ to agencies practice should say, by the way, your final decision should address this so that the requester is apprised of their rights regarding the fee assessment. Yeah, this, this is Ginger again. I, I think as we're having this conversation, one more useful avenue of research would be to look at the way that this provision in the Open Government Act of 2007 has played out in, uh, in case law. Okay, so you all have that on your list and um, so noted. <clears throat> we, um, we need to wrap up. Do we have any last minute comments for this subcommittee. We've heard next steps, which is you all are going to meet in December. Um, I'm sure you welcome additional people to be part of the subcommittee. So encourage everybody that hasn't um, thought about that to be part of that subcommittee. It is a big, big issue, um, one of our three priority issues. Okay. Now, we're going to turn to um, everybody else in the room <laughs> who have been very uh, patiently uh, listening and participating with your ears. Um, so we're, we're going to take um, comments for the next 20 minutes. It's now uh, 1230. If you wish to make a comment, if you wish to speak, uh, we would ask you to come to the microphone, um, the standing microphone, so that your comments are part of the recording of the meeting. Please identify yourself and your affiliation, and uh, we would ask you to please keep your comments brief and to the point so that everybody has a chance to participate. Um, we're also going to take questions from those um, watching the live stream um, as time allows. Um, you, if you are, if you are listening, um, you can uh, also um, go to ogis.archives.gov um, and you can also send us um, comments after this, of course, at any time at our email address, which is foia-advisory-committee at nara.gov. So. Our first commenter. My name is Michael Binder. I'm with the Air Force Declassification Office, but I'm speaking here on my own, not representing the Department of the Air Force, to 
Department of Defense or the U.S. government, although I'm on fairly safe ground because right now the Air Force is having its biweekly FOIA teleconference, so they should all be on that right now. I wanted to comment about two of the subcommittee reports. Uh, first, the Oversight Committee. There's a lot of oversight that's performed now. Every hour that's devoted to compiling information for oversight, purpose is taken away from the actual processing of FOIA cases. And in the House passed bill, they put more oversight in, which in my opinion adds nothing to make the FOIA process work better. So instead of additional oversight, I would recommend alternative oversight, something that actually works. I think what you need to do is to tie the oversight back to the organizations. And in that sense, the GAO, OGIS, or DOJ might not do it. It might have to be the inspector general that would have to do it. In the Air Force, uh, units get inspected by the inspector general. There's probably a checklist. There's going to be a few questions about information protection. Maybe there's a question about FOIA. And that's it. That's the extent of it. I'm not an expert on this, but that's my impression of how things are done. There really needs to be something more in-depth, and that needs to come back to the Air Force FOIA policy office. But what I really want to talk more about is the proactive disclosure. Um, I don't think this is going to help, really. We do a lot of work for National Security Archive. We can do a document, and we will give 95% of the document to the requester. The appeal letter has already been prepared. And it will come to us as if we had said in the letter of response, you have one day to appeal. It comes back, it's got the supporting document saying, you've given this information away before, how come you're not giving it to me again? Well, if we gave the document away proactively, we would still have to keep out the classified information. And so what would happen is it would come back to us as a FOIA, asking for that information. And then we would say, no, we can't do it. And then it would come back on an appeal. So instead of doing the re uh, review twice, the first for FOIA and the second for appeal, we'd be doing it three times. The first for proactive disclosure, the second for FOIA, and third for appeal. And I just think that that's not really going to accomplish too much. Uh, the notion about putting every document up, scanning is very labor intensive. If we're doing classified documents, which is the only thing that we do, we do that on the SIPR net. And then to post it, we have to go to the NIPR net. And sometimes we have to do that by hand, each page on the scanner manually. And so that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of uh, server space. And if the requester community wants to buy us a server so that we can put all these documents up there, maybe we could then work, work out a deal. But those are my comments. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> well, good. Can I respond quickly? Sure. Uh, Nate Jones, National Security Archive. Um, I, I'd welcome a chat after about frivolous appeals, and we can try and cut those down, but I don't think we do those. Um, but we can chat. And then secondly, as part of the FOIA Modernization Committee, I realize the classified world is tough, but from moving documents from the zipper net to the nipper net by hand does not seem very modern. And I think that's something we need to worry, to think more about as we think with 508 compliance and other ways to modernize to um, bring FOIA back to the top tier of the world. Thank you. And we definitely encourage communication between requesters and uh, agencies. So you're setting a, an excellent example. And if I may jump in for oh, three please. seconds. Sure. Um, I talk with you offline because there is mechanisms to do that automated versus hand scan. And if I would like to add uh, from Mr. Binder's comments, and this is for the proactive disclosure, when you get to the end product, you know, if it's a type of document that say most free, that what's ripe for proactive disclosure or classified documents, that is a real issue. You know, how, how, do, we, how do we deal with that? And of course you won't have that for, for a while. Because I have seen proactive disclosures, classified documents, like I said, still request. We even went in litigation over one. So um, how we handle that, I'm not sure. Uh, Kel McClenahan, I'm a private attorney with National Security Counselors. It's kind of uh, interesting that we brought this up, that there's a matter of communication, because the first thing that I have to say is about communication between agencies and requesters, especially with regard to fees. And that is that y'all 
identified an issue but didn't really get into it, the idea of the request for any and all records about X. And many of us who file these requests, both the, the professionals and just the generic requesters, file those because we get tired of really hyper semantic and narrow interpretations of requests. And we get tired of filing a request for, uh, and I'll use an, a litigation case that wasn't even one of mine, I think it was an ACLU case, where it was so narrow that the CIA said they had no records about the attention shake interrogation technique because they called it the attention grasp interrogation technique. You know, stuff like that, that they'll go and they'll litigate these issues to avoid conducting broader searches. And so that leads us to file these requests for any and all records. Now, understanding that it's unlikely to change the culture of inter interpret it as narrowly as possible, a way to get around this is if I file a request for any and all records about a subject, because I don't know what types of records you have. If you call me and say, this is gonna yield 50,000 pages, can you narrow it? My question is gonna be, tell me what kind of records you have and I'll narrow it. But very few agencies do that. They'll either deny it as overbroad or they'll just process it for the next eight years or they'll assess an, an enormous fee for it. And that's something that's really easy to work, work with. I've worked with OGIS and had OGIS call the agency and say, what are we talking about? And through OGIS come out, oh, I only, turns out I only need about 10% of the records that you have. And that's the first point I wanted to make about fees. The second is also about fees, is there's a phenomenon I've noticed recently in some agencies, that are, in many agencies actually, I won't even name names because it tends to be fairly broad that I think y'all should look at when you come to fee assessments and that is the delay in making them. I'm running into agencies that I'll file a request in 2011, they'll say we're processing it, we'll decide your fee category later and in 2014 they decide that they want to assess fees or that they want to deny a fee waiver or something like that. Things that should have been decided long, long ago because pretty much nothing fee related involves what records you found or even whether or not you had records. Fee waivers or whether or not disclosure of any responsive records would be in the public interest. News media is, are you news media? Not are you news media and we found 50,000 records? And these are determinations that should be triaged very quickly so that if you do want to assess fees, you assess them early. They're appealed, if they're appealed, they, if the person loses on the appeal, you don't process the request, you go, you move on to the next one. And it's something that can come really early in the process that would streamline it for a lot of agencies. And that's gonna bring me to the third point, which doesn't really narrowly fit within any one of your subcommittees. It sort of goes across all of them, except for the fee one, oddly enough. And that is the proactive disclosure committee talked about how you can get records about something, but you can't get the underlying information, or it's harder to get the information in one format versus the other. And when I heard that, that reminded me of something that I'd been meaning to mention to y'all before, which is a growing trend among government agencies to interpret FOIA to be for records and not for information. To the point that some agencies are even making arguments in court that records, the information in this database is not available to you unless you are logged into that database so it's not responsive under FOIA, only Xerox printouts of it are. And stuff like that that is, there's, I mean, in my opinion, I'm biased because it's my case. There's no real defense for that, to, for giving me a printout of a screenshot that has words running off the page. And I say, I want the words that are off the page. And they say, well, that's in the database. 
that's not responsive under FOIA. That's the worst example I can think of, but there is this, it's happening more and more to me and the requesters that I work with of agencies going, if it's not on a piece of paper or it's not saved as a discrete file in a system, it's not foia -able. And there's lots of case law on this. This should be a no-brainer, but they've lost touch of that somewhere along the way. And there should be a best practice when we're putting together best practices of if it's written down somewhere, it's a record, unless it you know isn't an agency record or something like that. But you know what format it is in is completely irrelevant to whether or not it's foiable. And that's all I have to say about that. Uh, one real quick response. This is Ginger. Um, we are Cal looking at the issue of of fees and other mechanisms to get requesters to narrow requests. Uh, I've heard frequently from agencies that the reason that they want to continue to assess fees is because it's a mechanism to get requesters to narrow. Uh, so this is something that we talked about quite a bit at our subcommittee meeting. It's something that we're that we're working on. This is Mark Zaid. I mean, when we're talking about some of the oversight, certainly those issues of communication and narrowing with the public liaison position, I know I always encourage agencies, you know, look, if you got a you have a question interpretation of what I'm looking for, call me you know, or any requester because a lot of the times, especially for those of us who are lawyers, when we do the any and all, this is how we've been trained to deal with discovery requests because we, we want to make sure we capture everything. And sometimes we capture far more than really what we want, but we don't know that because as Kel says, we don't know what your record base and your systems are. And oftentimes if you can call us and you say, well, you know you're going to be grabbing all of these files generally, and we go, oh, no, 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 I don't want that. Uh, and I don't even want you to waste your time on that. It, you, you can totally exclude it. Uh, it, it doesn't happen enough, uh, quite frankly. Uh, and that's something why we want to talk to the liaisons as well to have that better dialogue. Uh, you don't want to put any particular requesters on the pedestal, but there are requesters who are whether they're lawyers or they're just requesters who all the agencies know who frequently submit requests, that if you can build up that rapport with that individual, you can really minimize your work within the agencies. Melanie. Yeah, this is Melanie. I, um, uh, I just wanted to reinforce this whole concept of negotiating and talking with requesters. It helps me when I'm talking with agencies. It helps me to be able to tell them that requesters talk about how they appreciate being reached out to and that they are willing to narrow. It helps me pass that message on, so I appreciate you all saying that. And certainly we've negotiated with, with Cal on many a request. And we're in the process now of finalizing our e, e -learn, FOIA e-learning training modules. And we've really hit home on this quite a bit in those training modules, a, a request, um, encouraging agencies to reach out and talk with the requester about the scope of the request, what's, in, what's entailed, and then the benefits to everybody. So I think there it's something that if we, if we can just keep just expanding that kind of protocol, it'll be good all the way around. I, I think that's something uh, uh, Kel brought up, uh, sort of talks about uh, of attention here. We have a... Um, Jim. I'm sorry, Jim Hogan. I'm sorry, thank you very much, man. I appreciate that. I thought it was distinguishable. I don't <laughs> now, the, uh, a, n another tension we have, we didn't discuss in our subcommittee, uh, but we, I think is, is, is the FOIA backlog. We have a lot of pressure to reduce backlogs uh, from Congress, from requesters, from everywhere in administration. We understand that, and that's important. And every, any and all request does something to the backlog. And even the time to talk to the FOIA requester does something to the backlog. Even the time to, and a lot of times the FOIA requesters, or FOIA officers are not the records managers, are not the ones doing the search. And that's all, that, that sort of adds a bit. So that's what, I'm not, I'm not saying necessarily this is the, the, the case in all, in, for all FOIA requesters, but a lot of times that's in their backlog, they, in their back, back of their mind. They see this, this request, okay, that's adding the backlog, do you have to call this person? You know, and we encourage them to. Um, and I definitely understand the, the points Kel brought up. He doesn't have any idea what we have. He knows the subject matter. You know, what does he want? So maybe our committee can look at that somehow. I, I don't know if there is a good answer for that because each agency, even within the Department of Defense, we have a myriad of ways of records are managed and who's got what. 
and uh, how we do it. And it, it, it's a very difficult thing, which there may not be an answer to, but there is that tension that we recognize. Absolutely. This is Maggie. I just have a quick question. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know the answer to this. I mean, how frequently are indexes to federal uh, government mm -hmm. agencies updated and put out there? Because we, you know, we make our students look at the record mm -hmm. retention mm -hmm. schedules before they, or study the regulations so they know exactly what is kept and how, how they should ask for it. So, that that's that's a good question. And, and many times, especially electronics, uh, let's say someone has on the Office of Secretary of Defense staff, because I'm familiar with that, uh, deals with uh, issues in country X, and they'll probably, as they're dealing with the issues, they set up a. Uh, a, uh, a file on their hard drive, or not hard drive, on its chair drive. They put, add documents in, they revise them, they change things, and then at the end, there is a product that gets recommended that say up the chain, we want to do this. And there's maybe many, many emails between them and State Department and elsewhere. The emails don't necessarily come in within that index. And so the request comes in uh, for National Security Archive. We want to know what, what are you doing with what documents you have on country X and issue Y. Now that person's got a file there. That file, because it's still a working file, has not entered yet into any archival process yet. And uh, they're still working on it. And with, I'm just saying, this is sort of reality, with electronics, they've got a lot of documents in there and a lot of emails. And with the email, if, I, if we're you know, discussing with state, you know, those emails gotta be reviewed by everyone. So the indexes are sort of more general that don't always, to me, an answer specifically what's in that action officer's file and the staff. Um, they, they, I think they're a starting point in understanding the retentions uh, helps a lot, uh, but many times, uh, let's put it this way, I think action officers want to save just about everything anymore, and uh, rightfully so in some respects. So the, a lot of that is being caught into it, and the FOIA officer doesn't know what that, what's in that person's file sometimes. But maybe we need, maybe. in the subcommittee, we need to talk about this more. Yeah, absolutely. I think indexing is something that um, sh ideally would be at the top of the list, but it's at the bottom of the list. It's a records management. Yes, yeah. Which, you, um, quite frankly, if you don't have a good records management, you don't have a good FOIA program, I think. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Couldn't have said it better. <laughs> I had a comment. This is Ginger. Aren't all of the agencies required to create enterprise data inventories under the recent yeah. guidance? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, but. Yes. yes. So I think, what, no, I, think what, I think what Jim is saying is that you know, there's just requests so often encompass much more than a data set that's listed in an inventory. Yeah, exactly. I think that's it in a nutshell. The index is only one place that you can yeah. go, and mm -hmm. it's certainly. For one piece of data. Yes. Um, any, any, Maggie, I don't want to, I no, hate no, to no, cut sorry. you off, but Let's I, move on. I see we have another commenter and I oh, yes. want to be sure we get everybody in. Well, I, uh, I'm David Pritzker from the Administrative Conference of the U.S. and I spoke to you at this point at your first meeting to bring to your attention uh, our recent project and recommendation uh, that's been alluded to a couple of times today. Uh, Mark Grunewald's research uh, and the report that you have a link to in, in your minutes. Uh, th the only reason I'm speaking now is to call your attention to the fact, again, that there was a recommendation that came out of this. Uh, the whole purpose of our doing the study was to come up with re a set of recommendations uh, to OGIS and the agencies and just kind of peripherally uh, uh, a couple of sentences addressed to Congress. but. Uh, that recommendation addressed several points that were spoken of this morning. In particular, the matter of encouraging agencies to communicate where, where there are disputes, where there are differences, communicate with your requesters with or without the benefit of OGIS participation. And I, I was uh, pleased to hear what Melanie said about incorporating this into your training. Um, our concept of who would be the chief people for this communication uh, would be either the public liaisons or others in the agency that the public liaisons would be in touch with. Uh, the other thing that we, uh, that, that in our committee's deliberations that wound up in the recommendations was improving 
uh, and making more effective the roles of public liaisons so that, for example, in our recommendation, there are some specific suggestions about what kind of training and, uh, they should receive and getting greater uh, institutional support from the leadership of their agencies. So uh, that really is all I wanted to say to emphasize that this recommendation is our ultimate product and the, the report is, is background for this and uh, we hope that, that you can take the recommendation and run with it and incorporate it into what you do. Thank you. Thank you, David. <clears throat> A very important recommendation. Do we have anyone else who wishes to contribute at this time? If not, I'd like to remind you that um, we are always happy to receive comments. Um, you can visit the FOIA Advisory Committee website where you can find the uh, Contact Us <coughs> Comments uh, tab. Uh, that is at, uh, at ogis.archives.gov and look for the FOIA Advisory Committee. So, um, unless one of the members has something else to add at this point, I'm looking around, people are looking hungry. Um, uh, I think that we can um, pretty much wrap things up. Um, I think we've heard very specific next steps from the subcommittees, um, and we're gonna look forward to um, hearing about that additional work. Um, I want to thank Bill Carpenter and Ellen Knight from our Information Security Oversight Office who helped us with um, moving people around this morning and getting you to where you needed to be um, and also to the NARA AV staff. We appreciate that and uh, glad that we had the additional live streaming uh, today, which we didn't have in June. Um, one final note, when you leave this building, um, everybody, and that is everybody, every visitor and every staff member undergoes um, uh, a bag check on the way out. Um, please know that it's not uh, for any reason other than we want to check every single person and make sure that nobody's making off with our treasures, <clears throat> which we know you would not do. Um, but um, please just cooperate. It'll take just a, an extra minute or so for, for you to exit. And um, I want to thank everybody again. Thank the committee members. Thank you um, who are in the room participating. Um, and um, we stand adjourned. Thank you. Yes.